Welcome back, lovely people. It is time for another Q&A. This is part four of my animation Q&A. Part four because there are a lot of questions. Questions, yes. A while back, I posted a clip where I asked if anybody had any questions. Lots of people have questions. There's a lot to go through. So I want to go through that. And just in case you're wondering, channel, what? My name is JD. I do a channel where I do animation lectures. I do acting analysis clips. I do rig reviews, animation news, post feedback. I post product reviews, Q and A's, like I said, lots of stuff. So feel free to browse around. And if that's of interest to you, feel also free to subscribe so you don't miss any of my uploads. But that's the pitch every time, just in case you're wondering and you're here for the first time. But Let's go through, and as always, I'm gonna read through those questions. So if you wanna just listen to all of this, you know what the questions are. Let's get to it. Let me get comfortable here. It's gonna be usually a longer clip. <clears throat> so the mic is on this time. Yes, it is on. Then the first one is Original Dan with a longer question here. Sort of follow up to a previous question a week ago. Do you spend much time pre-planning or do you more often jump right into poses blocking? You've mentioned you visualize until it's clear in your mind. So how often do you film find reference? Film slash find reference. Does the visualization process get easier with experience or should every level jump into it a similar way? I found I'll visualize pose, block, spline, polish, only to change my mind much later and redo half the animation or over polish and ruin the whole thing. Uh, good question and it's probably an answer you don't like where I would say it depends. And I'm saying depends because if, it really depends if I am doing something at home, which obviously it's been a while, or something at work. And then at work, it depends how much time you have. Are we doing, is it early in the show where we have time? Is it something where I get onto a show where it's towards the end and it's just, you kind of get the shot and get going? Do we have time schedule wise to pre-plan? I think it really depends. Ideally, yes, you want to pre-plan. Um, the way I do it, if I would average the process, I definitely spend about half the time thinking about it and half the time, that's not true. The last couple of shows, it's been very vehicle heavy. It's kind of very Star Wars-y. Even that Marvel commercial, it was, it was a tighter schedule, so it was not that much time to shoot reference. So I say if I can shoot reference, I do. But if you have vehicles and Star Warsy things, you don't. I just kind of, you know, you gotta make your ships and stuff. And then depending on some creatures, like I remember um, like Force Awakens had those Raftars, those rolly things. So I did some tests for that. And then you kind of build the character on top of that, but there, was, there wasn't really any reference for it. So sometimes you just can't. Um, for Star Wars Squadrons, there was, um, there was an employee that shot mocap so we had that for reference we got the actual mocap data and then we got a close-up of the face and then you kind of pick and choose from that if it works and if it doesn't work sometimes you're gonna make it up so the close-ups that i did that was kind of me making it up because it just felt fast it was i had a clear idea of what i wanted to do again which goes back to um visualizing what do you want to do so if i can if it's something complicated i just want references to so i know what the process is if it's like fight scenes on on more fighty type movies or creatures that i know i don't know by heart in terms of how they move the locomotion and just the anatomy and how well, how they do stuff um but i find but most of the times lately it's been just thinking about it in my head and i mean it doesn't get easier it's just when you get something that's familiar then you can do it a bit faster but um just as a as a check I don't know. I feel like if it's something at work where it's a bit more high level and you know, you're working for someone, I just want to make sure that every box has been checked off in terms of I checked every reference, I looked at everything I can do, did all the research I needed to then get into the shot if there is time. Obviously, there's not always time for it. But I don't want to just go like, I'm going to make something up here on the couple hundred million dollar movie type of thing, blah, 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 blah. Not that I'm shouldering that responsibility and that the movie hinges on my shot. Not at all. But still, it's. I treat it differently than if I am at home. So if I do something with like some little test here or something for someone at home, uh, I might potentially be a bit more relaxed depending on what the end result is. It's not a long answer, but... Um, and you find that you re-visualize halfway through. Yeah, I mean, that's just different at work because you can't just change your mind and do something else. And you also have your marching orders in terms of do this and that's your goal. That's the story point you want to get across. So it's also somewhat quote unquote easier at work because you're given clear guidelines. Then if you just do something at home, like as a student, you make something up and then halfway through, you might not like it. And then you have to go and redo it. Uh, it's just a bit, bit of a different situation there. I, as always, I hope any of these uh, answers help. 
Next up is uh, Davin, 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 probably Davin. Hi, JD. I have a question. How big is our chance to be able to work in a big studio if taking online classes compared to someone who is self-taught? Thank you. That is a question I can't really answer because there are some people, there's someone at work that is primarily self-taught and is genius, like it's so good. And then some people do really well with online classes and some people do just as well with on-site classes where there's, you know, me as a teacher there and it's a class, you get up and you act things out and you, you work together and I, it really, that really depends on your ability to learn and what you prefer, what your learning ways are. Some people are very visual, some people like to read, some people learn best by doing. Um, so it's not really, I can't really say that. The chances are ultimately is it comes down to your portfolio where that's where you have control over it. You want to create something good that's on your reel. Then it's your interviews, it's your personality and how you come across in that interviews. That's somewhat where you are in control. And then it's just outside factors like timing and budget and things and where just, you know, or a pandemic where you have zero control of what's going on. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't think the online classes versus self-taught is making a difference. Ultimately, if your reel is good, that's your first step to get in there. We have Saket Malpani. I have two questions. <clears throat> One. How should I approach to acting facial shots after being done enough with body mechanics? Okay. Two, this one is kind of stupid and regarding job opportunities. It's probably not stupid. I want to know how do animators approach towards job opportunities? Do they send their showreel or portfolio to and every company or there is a website platform where we can post our showreel and various company recruiters can see it? Sorry for my bad English. I hope you can, I hope you are clear with, I mean to say. Totally clear, totally fine, don't worry. You speak multiple languages, don't be sorry. <laughs> One, so how should you approach the acting facial shots after being done enough with body mechanics? The thing is the, the classical way or the way I was um, taught was you do body mechanics first and then facial at the end. Everything has to go through your body mechanics as the attitude and the, the posing and everything and, and just the, the general body language. And the, the facial stuff is just the icing on the cake, which to some degree, I agree, it also depends if it's a full body or a close up, then you have to have a bit of a different approach. But what I would say is, once you are done with your body mechanics and you add in the actual facial stuff, what I see with the students and then something that's sometimes lacking in work is that you have to look at the amount of energy and force that the character is expelling, if that's the word, while they talk, right? So if you're whispering, going, it's going to be minimal shapes, minimal jaw. That is probably not going to affect the head unless there's a certain intent of, right? So do you have a specific accents that will tell us something more about the acting choice or the intent or maybe a subtext even. But if you have more energy and the character goes, hey, what are you doing here? Get off my lawn type of thing. You're gonna have, it's a giant over airplane. You have a lot of shouting, a lot of energy and you go, Rah! so you have to make sure that like in your body acting, you might not have that yelling in there because you haven't really thought about the lip sync yet. It might just be your, your whatever steps, sit down, whatever you have. And then make sure that you don't just do jaw and, and the shapes here, because otherwise it feels like you're yelling, but you're doing this, rah, 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 instead of rah, rah, you're still gonna have rah, something in the jaw that's gonna change the head, inhale potentially, but if, that, if you have that in your shapes or how real your, your shot is you know, in terms of style, but you're gonna, have, rah, you're gonna have more things that go with the amount of yelling or energy or whatever you have in, in the audio. So I would just say, the approach would be, don't forget that they're linked. So depending on what the person is saying and how they're saying it, and also in terms of subtext, like I always like to show that True Blood clip where she goes, I can I can depend on that. She doesn't go, I can depend on that, right? It's, I can depend on that, right? Just that head lift is, turns the thing from a question to a command. So I would just look at everything together. Do your body mechanics, but just be mindful of what is the character, the acting choices, what do you want to do? And with the lip sync, is the lip sync affecting the body? as well. And is there anything in your, in the lip sync in terms of the acting that will change the body, like the head up saying this, so it goes from a question to a command. Because a lot of times I see students who they do the acting, but not the acting that's based on the lip sync and the intent. It's more, this is bodily what it's supposed to happen. And then they do the lip sync and then it's just kind of, it just feels separate where the body mechanics do one thing and then the lip sync and you know the audio says something else and just, just make sure that you can then go back and change your body mechanics a bit to potentially emphasize or add subtext or something to the performance, if that makes sense.
So the question is here, how do animators approach uh, job opportunities? So usually you send your reel to the company. The company has an online portal where you upload your reel, you put in your cover letter, your resume. That's probably the first thing that you do. Um, I would also just post it on social media if you can for visibility. Maybe that someone sees this and recommends that what they saw to someone else in the HR department or to a supervisor who then gets the machine rolling and going to hire that person. But there is Zerpli, I think that was the site. There are a couple of sites, I don't remember all those different names, but where they kind of collect, um, where people can put their reels on there. I don't know if recruiters go specifically on there. So I know there are sites that focus on reels where you can post your stuff as a showcase area, but I don't know if recruiters go there. That's my ignorant answer. So I don't know the process there. The, I mean, don't ignore the, the regular process of looking at the company website and seeing when they say we're looking for someone, how to apply and doing everything on their site and uploading things that should be done 100%. And then outside of that, if, again, if you find a site that posts real, why not post it there? Like, why not post your reel on LinkedIn? Uh, because tons of professionals are there. So I would do that second. And then, you know, in Instagram and Twitter, just for visibility and maybe it goes viral or not, it doesn't matter. But like the more visibility you have, the more it might potentially increase the chance that someone sees it that has the right influence to show it to someone else that's going to decide if you want, if you can get an interview. Maybe, I don't know. I've heard of someone, more than one, where they got a job through social media. So again, that's why I'm always re um, adding that. I wouldn't discount that. Noel, Noel Curry, Curry, Curry. Hi, JD. I'm currently a 2D animator here in the Philippines. I just want to ask, what do you think is the future of cartoons? Will our industry be obsolete? Do I have to learn 3D if that happens ASAP? Can you give us some idea on transitioning to 2D to 3D? Thank you. Additional question. I only know how to animate. Does an animator should also know how to design his own character to animate? Good questions. Um, and I'm going to be very ignorant about the first one where I don't know the future of cartoons. Will the industry be obsolete? No, I don't think so. And do I have to learn 3D if that happens ASAP? Let's put it this way. There was a big shift from 2D to 3D. So yes, that happened where you should learn 3D, blah, 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 blah. But now as it continues, 2D is some, I wouldn't say somewhat coming back, but there's more work in 2D than it was before. It's still not huge. And the box office is not the same as 3D. But then you also, you're going to have 2D in, in TV. That would be my, again, I'm not an expert on this. So this is a very ignorant answer, but like I'm watching Star Trek Lower Decks. There is some 3D in there, but it's also a lot of 2D mainly. So I think depending on time and budget, 2D is going to be better and faster and cheaper to some degree, depending on the style, you got to keep it limited. And I think that's why TV uses it a lot too. If you have a full CG show and TV, yeah, to me, that seems, again, I have a zero insight, but that seems just very time consuming and expensive. Also really cool if they can do it. But if you stay limited in 3D, it can also look kind of cheap subjectively. If it's like, there's not enough movement and you have all that, especially also if they texture it and light it in a specific way, you have all that. 3Dness and the tangible aspect of 3D models, but then the, the animation is so limited. To me, that's kind of a clash. And that, to me, you can get away with more limited 2D animation. So I don't think 2D is going to go away, but who knows? Like, I don't know. Again, I have zero idea. Um, can you give us some idea on tra transitioning? I can't because I don't know 2D. I've done it in school, like a class or two, but that's all. So I can't really uh, tell you that. I apologize. But if anybody's watching this, who's done 2D, who's transitioned, or has more uh, knowledge with that, feel free to comment and uh, help know. And in terms of animate, do you, sh do you need to know how to design a character? Yes and no. I mean, you can just animate and be successful, quote unquote, whatever success means to you, but you can do that. Then some people also like to rig and some people also like to design or do storyboards. So anything you know more than just animate is gonna open up your skill set and it's gonna, you know, widen your, your your uh, attractiveness to anybody who wants to hire you, if that's your goal. And if you are more an independent animator, want to do your own things, then it helps you because you can do more things on your own. You have a bit more control. Or if someone else does it, at least you have the knowledge to critique it in a proper way. So if I will get something, like if I would do something and I, have, I see designs, I can only speak in terms of this is how I, I react to it. And this is what I can imagine the character to be, but I can't give very specific design notes in terms of how to design a character and do's and don'ts. So I think the more you know, the easier it's going to be for you to understand what you see and get feedback. 
but do you have to no no um just depends if if you want if you have the time if you have enough time to do animation really well and learn it really well while doing another thing also really well i think there's always going to be not enough time for anything that's on top of just animating but some people are really good at being generalist and to do fantastic work so it just comes down to how you learn do you have the time do you have the financial means uh, means and, and so on so it's kind of it's kind of a non-answer. I don't know if I can answer this uh, in a helpful way. Badal Bram Bramhecha. Bramhecha. Badal. I don't know. What are expectations of studio from a new animator? Well, depends on the studio, depends on the product, depends on the style and where you are. I mean, I can't speak for other studios, but I think the minimum would be that you're at least proficient in terms of body mechanics and polish, where your animation looks correct, within the confines of your style right super stylized versus photo real like that gamut or whatever you do at games and or vr and stuff but at least you want to look at work and not go oh there was a pop or there was a one frame direction change or the body mechanics were off the balance is off the way it's just too light all of those things need to work i would say that's probably the minimum and then you're going to look at creative choices uh if if it's a studio that's heavily relying on performance where it's a lot of acting stuff, then they're probably going to look at the acting first and hopefully body mechanics obviously is not a distracting thing that's wrong. So what are the expectations that you can animate? That sounds really stupid, but I, I, by animate, I mean, again, no pops, there are nice arcs. It's just technically looks you can animate. That doesn't mean that you have good ideas or it's dramatic or funny or whatever. That's obviously the next thing. And, and if that stands out, very creative ideas of how to do either an acting piece or something else, that's going to be the extra plus because the thing is ultimately everybody gets to a point where they can polish things well and that's kind of that's why to me it feels like that's the minimum line that everything above that is what's important your creative ideas and choices and just your your sensibility of, of humor and, and timing and stuff like that but it needs to have at least uh no pops crazy arcs off balance stuff stuff like this and it's usually when you watch something within a second or so you can tell ooh that was off that's weird that's too stiff that's kind of too twin like there's just some there's a list of, of technical things that you you can see if they work or not within a second or two so Badal is asking question again how to work as an independent artist uh, I don't know I'm not an independent artist how will we get work I don't know I'm not an independent artist how will we earn from it I don't know so basically this is all about independent artists what is most challenging to work as an independent artist or to work in a studio? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. What kind of challenges or difficulties you face when you work as an independent artist? This is all about independent artists. I don't know because I have been working at a studio for almost 17 years. That is my bubble. That's all I know. I have not done freelance. Uh, I haven't worked as an independent artist. So unfortunately, this whole section, I don't know. I would, I would have some guesses, but then I feel like they're just uninformed guesses that will waste everybody's time. So any independent artist, post in the comments if they have links, uh, if you have your experiences or tips and tricks, um, I would look at uh, the comments if possible. Jose Pablo Granera. Hey JD, do you have any tips regarding characters interacting with other characters or with props? Like maybe when to use parents or constraints or locators or just by keyframing? It's an interesting question. I would say interacting with other characters. I think it will all depend on the length of time of that interaction. And by that, I mean, if you have someone that just kind of does like a head push, I'm doing this because I'm sitting, it's easier. If I just do this, I wouldn't use any constraints because it's it's just a couple frames of pushing. So I would just go frame by frame and you can have this and the, and the, complex, the complexity of the fingers pushing, the shape going in, all depending on the style, obviously. If it's more stylized, it will be simpler. None of that squishiness here, potentially. So to me, if it's something very short, then I keyframe it to punch, a shove or something or yeah even even if like if i move i have a glass here so if i move that glass quickly or if i you know if, if this is on the on the floor and i do something like this to me this is all short and i would keyframe that if you hold something for a longer piece of uh, period of time constraints um and then it depends on the extra control that i want to have so if i do this right i I will probably constrain this to the wrist. I would have a hierarchy of multiple locators parented underneath and then all that grouped. And then I would have that, the phone within, within that group and 
to me, the, the group would be parented to the hand. So basically, if I do this, the phone will go with it. But the problem is that if I now rotate my wrist, the phone is gonna stay put, right? So you have to make sure that it's constrained to the, uh, translates in the rot rotate so that if I move my wrist, it's basically doing this, it follows that. But what you're missing, if you just do a, a straight parent constraint or point orient constraint like this, is that you don't have any of this. You don't have any flexibility of changing the finger pose, which then changes the phone. So that's why you want multiple controls where you still have extra control where, yes, it follows it, but you can still have a locator underneath where you can animate the phone independently. So even if the fingers do nothing, you can still do this with the phone. So now you can start animating fingers and have the phone react to it. So that it's that's kind of my my um, process in terms of handling um, props. And even if you if you have interaction with the character, if you do a fight scene and someone holds this, I don't want to just constrain it like this because then you you don't have possibilities to do this. You still want that hands to follow this arm, but you might, you know, like this, there's squishiness here. So if I do like a like that, I want that to, again, depending on the style, but if it's more photoreal, you're gonna have compression here and then your skin and muscle and tendon and fat, whatever, depending on where you, where you touch things, it's going to move alongside the thing I'm holding. I can still do, do all of this while I do this, right? So I wanna have a setup that allows me a constraint to follow each other depending on what the action is and within that another at least one other controller where i can do still extra stuff to move the wrist or whatever you have and that's kind of that's kind of that because if it's a longer thing and you start keyframing things to me it takes way too long and, and also you might end up having a right, jitter because you're not you're not in this in the same spot and with a constraint you are in the same spot but then it looks constrained where it's way too clean so you want a bit of imperfection and changes so that's why i have that multiple hierarchy uh, approach. Next question by Deborah. Hi JD, could you please give advice on how to choose the area field and animation that you fit into the most? As for, how can you choose between pursuing 2D, 3D, or even modeling and rigging? How did you find your own personal preference? Thank you for reading, amazing channel by the way. Thank you so much, that's very kind of you. Uh, and I can't really answer that. It's tricky because how do you find the, the chosen field? I mean, I wanted to do um, I wanted to do visual effects. So that's the first class that I took at the academy, and uh, I don't think I even I might have even walked out of the class. It's probably I sat in the class, and once the class was done, I realized too much scripting, too much math and stuff, and it's not hands on. So actually, I wanted to do special effects, like like in terms of computer special effects, and that was then when I realized that doesn't work. Well, let me just try animation, character animation type stuff. And that's kind of how I found my preference. I kind of knew what I wanted, but not really. I was, I was not, I was very naive going into this. And then it was kind of like a blind choice of, well, you know, because I liked, I grew up, you know, I'm, I'm a child from the eighties, meaning like I have Star Wars and Star Trek and Yana Jones and Ghostbusters and Goonies. And like, just, that's just a lot of ILM work, but it's a lot of visual effects, twisters and, and, and lightsabers and lightning and stuff like that. And I thought that was really cool. I liked animation as well but I wasn't very smart and I, I lumped this all into one thing. And once I realized that, oh, if you do those kind of effects with simulations and stuff, it's not the hands-on thing that I was wanting to do. I'm sure there's a way to do it hands-on as well, but it's just at that point, it's like, ah, it's not what I want to do. Let me just switch to character animation. And thankfully I liked it and, and, and you know, and the rest, I don't say the rest is history. It sounds so arrogant, but I, that's where I am now. Like I'm doing character animation, but we are doing other things at ILM where it's not just characters, it's also vehicles and all kinds of things. So it's different stuff, which I like a lot. So that's kind of how I found it. The reason why I'm saying I can't really answer is because I don't know your preferences. I don't know your, your affinity to certain areas or your quote unquote talent. So I don't know. I don't know if you want to do 2D or 3D. It depends. What do you really like? And then it depends on what are the opportunities. Maybe you really like 2D, but where you are city-wise, there's no industry that supports 2D. So you might have to move somewhere. Is that something that you can do in a four? I don't know. Maybe you have to go to a different country. That's even trickier. So it, I know like you want to do modeling or rigging. That depends 100% up to you in terms of your initial, you know, initiative. I want to do this. And then it depends. Can you do this in terms of location? Financially, are there any, is there any schooling around? Do you prefer, as we talked about before, do you prefer on-site schooling? Is it okay to do online? I think there's many, many factors that are very specific to you that I can't really um, answer. So yeah, I can only answer my personal preference. 
Next up, Don Newman. My question is a follow-up to the effort video. How do you catch yourself when you are over tweaking and need to move on? I think at work, there is no over tweaking. This is going to sound really weird. It's because you have, you have your specific goals and things you need to do and you have a specific deadline and that deadline is always going to be there. And depending on maybe some factors, it might get pushed to some degree, but that deadline is there. So I can't really over tweak. But to me, over tweaking sounds like I have too much time. <laughs> and I never really have too much time when it comes to work stuff. So there's always, there's always a looming deadline. You always know that I got to get this done by then. And, and I always wish I had more time. So I think it will have to be something, if I do something at home where I have an open deadline, it's my own deadline. The way I would, it's, it's been a while, but the over tweaking, to be honest, it's hard to answer because it's, I, I set very specific self-imposed deadlines. Like even like the last clip with the pigeon that I always reference is the last clip that I did. I did that over the weekend, two days. And I wanted it A, because I wanted to show it to the students next week. And I also don't want to spend more time animating, which is more time away at home from my family. So to me, it was, I have whatever, nine hour block, a 10 hour block during the day. And at the end of those two days, I'm done. Even if it's not great, I'm not going to touch this anymore. And I did the same thing with other clips that I worked at, at home where I had kind of a, I'm going to work on this for a couple of days and that's it. I probably should have spent more time to really finesse it more, but I don't know, I always had the, the, I don't know, for me, it was always a work, it's always been a work-life balance, even as a student, even though I worked a lot more as a student, like long hours, uh, getting my work done and, you know, for class and stuff and having a reel that looks good. But so quickly after that, I just, I just like to sleep and I like to be healthy and I just, I don't work well if I'm tired or sick, obviously. So to me, it's always, it doesn't matter what's going on. I'm always going to force myself to stop so I can rest, spend time with family, or right now exercise, where just, there's always a balance where I don't always constantly work because physical deterioration, and you also get tunnel vision, you don't have enough perspective where if you're always there and looking at your work, after a while you kind of lose track of what's going on and I need to have a little breaks so and come back with fresh eyes. So that's why, that's why I have to be honest, I have a hard time answering that question because I'm not, I never really over tweak because the over tweak at work is there's always a deadline. Someone's going to go, hey, where's the shot? So you can't do too much. And then at home, I have my own deadlines where I just wanted, I don't want to over tweak. Let's pretend I'm over tweaking. How do would I catch myself? I think there comes a point where you will have to realize it. And that would be my ignorant answer to a hypothetical situation where I go, if I'm constantly watching this and then I go, oh, three hours have passed. Maybe I should stop looping my shot and look at things. Uh, that's when I catch myself. You know what I mean? Like that's, I think it's when I, when I realize based on time, maybe that's an answer where I go, where did the time go? I haven't done anything. Um, I don't know, but I just have also very rigorous kind of work flow where I look at the things that I need to do and I make a list either mentally, if it's a long list and I write it down. And then as I fix my stuff, I go through that. I need to do this is this. Okay. Now continue on. I think the only thing where I, it's not that I over tweak, but where I spend time is just, I sit and watch it and I go over and over and over and I go, is the root working? Is the chest working? Is the head working? Arms. So I want to make sure that everything has nice arcs, no pops. And then you got to take a step back and then look at, does it work as a whole? Now let me check elbows for arcs. Does it work as a whole? That I would say it's not an over tweaking, but I just have a, I have that list that I go through so that I, maybe that helps me not over tweak. This is such a rambly answer. Don's going, this was useless. <laughs> useless answer. Oh, uh, all right. Abraham, Abraham, the shame, the shame, the shame. That was more like, reminds me of a Shawshank Redemption there. I have a very, very important question that demands the utmost attention. My question is, what's up? How are you doing? Yeah, I couldn't think of anything at the top of my head. Well, Abraham, Abraham, uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm going to end this. This is what, seven minutes into my second taping. So it's going to be like a 40 minute uh, Q&A. How about we end it with that? I'm doing well. I'm slightly tired because I got up and I did the Q&A right when I got up. Um, so I'm not tired of anything. I'm just kind of sleepy and uh, I need to get dressed. This is kind of like my shirt that I put on that I found. Let's put on a hat, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, I'm good. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> 
it's a good it's a good question to answer um because it kind of goes back into maybe over tweaking i'm going to end this q a with make sure that you do have a system in place where you catch yourself where you just you have a bit of a a like i said a list to go through what to pay attention to you know is clarity there are the poses clear does the timing work the mechanics wise did you go through like do you work layered where like i work layered in terms of i look at the root and the chest and the head it all builds on top of each other then you take a step back as a work as a whole but sometimes you tweak something and you work on the root and you think this is all smooth then you look at the whole thing and go, oh but that changed the feeling and the timing of the general thing that i wanted to do and you kind of mess it up so you have to always kind of i at least go i always go back and forth but yeah i would say just try to find a system so you don't over tweak find a system that is so you don't overwork yourself uh, make sure you take breaks. Uh, I always find like, I just find that I'm faster and better when I take frequent breaks. And that break can just be a couple minutes where you just kind of get up and move around a bit, maybe go downstairs. I always have either a glass of water or my bottle somewhere, bottles downstairs, uh, and I just refill. It just forces me to get up, stretch a bit, and I come back and I look at something, hopefully fresh eyes. Like, oh, okay, let me just tweak this. I didn't see this before. Um, every now and then, of course, um, you are in some form of flow or uh, something in like, some groove where you just really want to finish this and then you then i push things where i go i should probably take a break and i got the reminders on my watch and everywhere like you should get up and stand up and stretch your legs and i go no 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 no, no. i ignore this i want to finish this moment yes that happens i definitely have moments where i just overdo it where i just two or three hours straight eyes are red and do this but i just really want to get to that moment because you have that inspiration or you're just in that nice groove of finishing and then i take a longer break because again i don't want to i still want to get in a situation where i compromise myself physically either my eyes my back my my shoulders my fingers because then that's going to force me to not work right so and then i can't which means i can't finish a project i have to take time off what if i don't have any time off left then it's unpaid that creates problem with bills and so on and so on. It's, it, there's a you know, repercussion things of if you're just physically not able to animate. So I just put a big emphasis on staying healthy, quote unquote, and then my students know how much chocolate I eat and and sometimes what the crap that I eat and it's just not healthy. So like, I'm not, you know, I'm not 100% great here in terms of staying healthy. But uh, yeah, that will be the answer to how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm ended at that. Again, I don't, I don't know if that's helpful at all, but I'll leave it with, I hope you're doing well, all of you that are watching this. Uh, I hope that anything that I'm saying here was helpful because you spend time and I hope it wasn't a waste of your time. Um, you can still post questions if you want in the comments. I'm still going through the main post and there are some questions every now and then that come up. So I'm going to fold that into another part. Uh, and that's kind of that. Take care of yourself. Make sure that you take care of yourself and your loved ones and uh, stay healthy. Definitely work if you can animate, have uh, have a good uh, process and workflow to get there in a, in a good and efficient way and uh, find something that you can latch on to that you love about what you're doing right now so that you have the, the energy to continue through moments where you are doubting yourself or the feedback that comes in that makes you doubt yourself. And uh, I'm rambling, so I'm going to leave it at that. That's it. So thanks for watching. And, you know, the usual pitch, like and subscribe. That's what you say on YouTube. Um, but I've seen people subscribing more than lately. I don't know why, because I've kind of reduced some of my posts. So thank you. Thank you for subscribing. I saw a lot of people commenting on my Woody. That sounds really weird. My Woody clip, my Toy Story clip of the, the toy attached to the car that I filmed 10 years ago. I don't know. It's a long time ago. For some reason that clip is back in rotation. I don't know what's going on there anyway. It's fun. It's fun to do the channel. It's fun to see what people react to. And the fact that people are tuning in and watching and subscribing still blows my mind. I think I just crossed 22,000 subscribers. I am confused, um, but I'm very grateful. And I hope that whatever I'm putting on the channel is of help and entertaining and just something where you don't feel like this is a massive waste of time. Um, speak of time. I'm going to find some more time. I have some schedule changes coming up. So there's going to be a bit of a change in the channel where I can get back to my regular output because I have a lot that I want to do. I've got some packages from sponsors that I want to open up, unbox in my review closet and review and I have so much I want to do. So I'm going to reschedule stuff a little bit so that I can find the time to do it. Anyway, rambling is still going on. So I'm going to say stop it. 50 minutes. This is probably a 45 minute Q&A. So thank you. Thanks for watching. I will see you next week. 
I might post a critique tomorrow. I know it's a Saturday, but I just want to keep, I have so many critiques I want to post as well. So the posting continues. Feel free to comment, like, and subscribe if you want to. Recommend the channel to people who you think might, uh, might like this and, and, and that might benefit from it. Anyway, that's it. And uh, I'll see you next week or maybe tomorrow. And thank you.